Welcome back, everybody, to the Home Inspection Whisperer podcast. I got Michael Conrad, and if you don't know who Michael Conrad is, he runs a multi-inspector firm out of Nashville, Tennessee. He's pretty successful. He's up there in the, the upper volume of multi-inspector firms. How many inspectors you got now? I forget. We have 10. Holy cow. Dang, I know. Man. You're smoking me now. I'm at nine. So you're 10 inspect. Are you including yourself? I'm not. 10 plus oh. me. <laughs> 10 plus you. All right. So, and then uh, we kind of follow the same path marks. We do stucco inspections. He does radon inspections. And uh, he mainly focuses not just on home inspections. You do a little bit of everything. You do mold too, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. We've, we, we've gone uh, as wide as we've tried to go deep. <laughs> nice. So, um, so going into it, this episode, what we're going to talk about is client tolerances and, you know, client tolerances are a little bit, you know, it's a fickle topic there because each, each inspector, each house can have five different clients and each client is going to interpret it completely different. You know what I mean? Like, so you can have a first time home buyer, you can have someone that's bought 15 homes, you can have someone that literally doesn't care, or there could be a crack on the wall and they're not going to buy it. You know what I mean? So as a home inspector, it's, it's a tough thing to navigate, I would say. You know totally. I mean? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I have found that there's a, a couple different classic archetypes amongst buyers, and they all come with their own sort of uh, ball of wax, right? I mean, your classic is your first time home buyer. Typically, they're going to be young. Um, they don't have a lot of experience and any knowledge they have about it. They've maybe gleaned from a friend, a family member, a parent. And so they have a lot of secondhand information. So they both need to know a lot and they know that, but they also think they know a lot and that can be hard sometimes. Oh man. Uh, that kind of reminds me whenever I first started buying a home, I was like, I'm getting my home inspection license. I know everything, you know, cause I was come with my father and I was like, my father's a home inspector and I'm kind of glad it didn't work out, but I, I thought I knew everything and I was going to buy a home with, that had like a four inch dip in it <laughs> and like, it was bad. And the, the roof problems, like, oh no, I'm fine. I could tackle it. But it's funny. It's just, that kind of made me relate to like being able to interpret how bad these problems are. And it made me into a better home inspector because I didn't end up buying the home. I, I don't think we even met financing or something. I can't really remember. That's back when I was poor. And, uh, um, are you not yeah, poor anymore? I, I don't know. I, I guess that's relative, right? <laughs> I got my own office. So that's hey. nice. That's not poor. There you go. This, this office is probably the size of my ha first house I was going to buy. <laughs> it was a little condo. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. That was kind of in my ADD tangent there. But what I was No, saying, but you know, be, besides first time home buyer, um, another one that comes to mind is you're super experienced, laid back, They've bought like six or 10 homes. They're professional. Typically, they're in an upper echelon income bracket. Um, and these people, maybe, maybe your parents' age, maybe somewhere around there, and they are easy to work with. So that's kind of the spectrum, if you ask me. You've got these people that are real jittery and can kind of really take up a lot of your time. And then you've got these people that, I mean, they just know they're checking a box and they know that it's cool and they're easy. And But there's a lot of them in between. Yeah, yeah you're talking about that, that long, you know, the easy clients and I'd like them. They, they come in with their notebook, right. And they're just like, all right. So roof, you know, they're just like roof foundation, yeah. uh, panel box, AC, how old, you know, water heater. And they're like, okay, mm. we're good. You know, all right, thanks. That's all I want to know. And then you have that first time home buyer and they're talking to you about paint colors and, you know, and like cuts in the carpet and whatnot. And I'm just like, all right, you need to stop worrying about these things, you know, think about big ticket, big dollar items, and, you know, the tolerance level. And so the strategy that I try to figure out, because this actually affects your report writing process too, right? Yeah. So I've actually opened up the strategy of whenever I first got into the business was the asking them, what are their major concerns as soon as you meet them? So like, as soon as you meet them and you can determine like, are these, are these clients going to need to know absolutely everything or are they only care about the major items? You know, you can almost judge the level of care you have to give this client or attention based on certain items or how much you're going to have to explain about the property. So 
by you adding that into your process, as soon as you first meet the client, stop whatever you're doing and ask them. And honestly, they'll walk you to a problem that you may have not seen yet, you know, so it kind of helps out. So what's your strategy, would you say? Yeah, we call that an R&D five minutes. So we place this right at the very beginning of the, um, of the time they're on site. So if you are doing your inspection and you've been there 15 minutes or you've been there an hour and a half and the client rolls up, you stop what you're doing, dust yourself off a little bit, compose yourself, and you go into friendly home inspector customer service mode. And you want to get to know them. You do a lot less talking and you do a lot more listening. You ask them a couple strategic questions and you try to gauge who they are. Are they a skitterish first time home buyer? Are they a cool breeze experienced home buyer? Are they gonna badger you with lots of questions indicating that they have a lot of need for information? Or are they just gonna sort of be cool and try to measure for drapes, you know, indicating that you can just sort of run your process. So that first five minutes that a client shows up on site, I teach the guys, look, stop. You got to stop your mental sort of technical mindset and you got to move into that human connection yes. mindset because that little first few questions, ask them about the weather, talk about the local sports team, whatever, some sort of human connection. Not only are you laying a base layer of humanity that you're going to rely upon the rest of the inspection experience because that you're as the inspector you're the human connection and so they can get mad at a company or they can get mad about a problem but if there's a human involved they can talk to that human and so you want to make that human connection and in doing so you want to learn about them and we call it tightening the tines of the comb or loosening the tines of the comb as as we all want to go over the house with a fine tooth comb you know if the client's easy well then maybe we get a little bit more uh, relaxed about it yeah you're not going to document every crack in the whole home right you're you're not exactly there whenever he's saying you know a little bit easy you know that can be interpreted different ways and i know exactly what conrad means he he's talking about only really focusing on the major problems. He's not going to document every stain, every dink on the, in the home, but there are clients that want you to do that. And I, I see this question all the time with home inspectors and home inspectors will be like, the client is upset about a stain on the wall and they want me to put it in my report. You know, should I do that? I'm like, that is such a stupid question. Of course, it doesn't matter what's in the report. You know, if they want that stain in the report, it's their report. Put it in there. It, it takes two seconds of your time. Well, is it going to decrease the legitimacy of your report? No, because the stain is there. But what you're saying is, is, you know, if the client's more laid back, you can really just focus on the meat and potatoes of the, of the inspection report and really give that big ticket items for them. You so know, it's funny you bring that up. Um, I think that's a pretty large misnomer with a lot of clients, home buyers. But I actually think a lot of inspectors, even if they're experienced, don't realize that the inspection report is just this educational tool for the home buyer. It's not some sort of document that has to exist for the next stage. And so people call us up and we're like, hey, can you put this thing in the report? Now, I take it a little differently than you. I say, look, if you think it's important, it's important. You should ask for it. You don't need my permission and you certainly don't need it to be written down in a home inspection report. Now, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, the seller wants to see it. And I'm like, look, with the state of the real estate world it is, the sellers aren't looking at the whole report anyways. If you think it's important, if you want a freaking pink pony, ask for it. You can do whatever you want in a home, in a real estate transaction. It's essentially custom and you don't need my permission for it. Right. No, exactly. And, and they want to ask for it, but I think it's fine, you know, put it in there and you're right. Yeah. They can ask for the pink pony in the backyard if they want <laughs> It's, and you know what? I think that's good for people out there to know, you know, home inspectors, whether they're experienced or not, is you can make the decision to make an edit or you can make a decision to hold the line and not make edits. That actually doesn't matter. But communicating that information to the client that they're in the driver's seat and that what they think matters matters right. and that you're there as sort of a confidant or a shepherd or a helper or an information guy, that's what's important. And so the report is a vehicle to empower them, not necessarily so you can some check some box, you know, and continue through your transaction. No, well, that 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 really falls back and we're gonna I'm gonna digress for a second is you know, talking about the human connection that you were talking about. And, yeah. and that is probably one of the best things that I've learned, you know, getting in the industry is like, you know, 
coming into the home inspector world, you could just be a robot and just walk through and take pictures and, and put in a report and then walk away. But those are the people who are the ones that get the callbacks all the time. But if you bring in that human connection where you walk in and you talk to them, you talk to them about the Astros for a second, you know, whatever, and you show them that, hey, I'm here, I'm here to work for you and I'm gonna do my best to find everything I can today, they are, they're gonna be more willing to compromise if, they, if you missed that one little thing or the rotted baseboard or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So that human connection is not just important for right then and there or down the line, but you know, it's that human element, letting them know that we're not Superman. We're not gonna find everything. And you know, <clears throat> this is, plays true for agents as well. So the language we'll say sometimes is, you have to have real relationship to undergird or support like the transaction relationship. And so if all you are is just a person that they call and that they pay some money and to go out and do it, whether it's a client or an agent, if that's all you are, then they're gonna feel like uh, they can be mad and that's okay because the relationship is thin. But if you have a real connection and you try to make that happen at the beginning of the inspection, or if you really know your agents and you're really like pursuing relationship with them over the long term, if something goes wrong, they call you and they talk to you almost like a friend, you know, like a professional acquaintance, you know, because they feel like they have that human connection before they go to guns, you know, and, and, and they're always about to go to guns because emotions are, are high in real estate. And so yeah. you want to have something beneath just that transactional, you know, relationship. Right. And, you know, that falls into like, that happens to us all the time. We're, we have really good relationships with all our top producers. Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've talked about that in the past, about how you maintain the relationships. You can go back and listen yeah. to other episodes about that. But like that, like following into that, it's just, you get that, they get, they call you, right? And be like, hey, you know, I have a client, you know, there's a lead jack, it's leaking. He think that you don't, you know, you may not have caught it. And what does that cost us? Like three or $400 just to send a roofer over there, just to put a lead jack on there. Oh shit. One of your, sorry. One of your home inspectors can, can put that, put that yeah, put that lead jack on there. You know, it, it allows you to fix a problem before there's actually a real problem. You know, you can, it, there's not that buffer zone where they're like, I'm going to sue you and tear apart your whole home inspection report because that's how it goes in the home inspection world. Totally. You know, it, the guy that was just yelling at me a second ago, he was like, well, I'm going to call my lawyer. I'm like, well, sir, if you want to call your lawyer, you're the seller of the property anyways, call your lawyer. You know, like, it's just, oh man, that was a, something. That was, uh, it's important to communicate. <clears throat> and I don't, I've not yet figured this one out. So anyone out there listening, please feel free to join the conversation because what I want to tell people, I want to talk to them about proportional value. If they feel like you've missed something, it doesn't really matter what type of client it is. I don't feel like they understand this kind of idea of proportional value. Like, oh, we put 50 good things in the report and they were useful for negotiation and you think it's useful information and one thing wasn't worded correctly or one thing was missed or whatever. And they think, well, I mean, you've completely screwed me and it's 100% valueless at this point. And I'm like, well, I mean, is it? I mean, or is it more of a proportional reduction in value? I mean, that's something I haven't figured out how to talk to them about because people don't think in those terms, but that's what it is. So you're, you're saying like they walked in the home, they negotiated like $30,000 off the property value. They move into the home and say there's an active water leak somewhere, right? And they're like, your whole home inspection was shit, but I made thirty thousand dollars. You know, yeah, like, they're like, give us, give me my money back, and give me enough money to hire somebody else because I can't trust the rest of your report. And I'm like, why'd you lose faith in the rest of the report? It was useful five minutes ago. You know, what I mean, <laughs> yeah. that that is that is a difficult thing to talk about. Like, how do you bring that up with the client and then be like, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> like that's, yeah. that is a that is a hard you know. It's funny, we were talking about easy clients, you know, these experienced guys that come in, um, you know, I've done it a couple of times. I find, and you tell me, but I find that it rarely follows money. Like, do they have a lot of money? Are they buying an expensive house? That, that's not what it's about. It's typically about number of purchases that they have gone through. It's about like number of experiences because I'll tell you, there's another type of client and that is a whole lot worse. And that one is, super high end. They've got a lot of money. They've got money to burn. They've got money to sue you. They've got money to buy a house cash. They've got the money coming out their ears. 
those clients can be really tricky. So you're, so you're saying like they have a lot of money and they have not purchased very many homes. Those well, regardless of number, number of homes, most of the time, the money creates a mindset and that's, I'm going to get what I want and whatever logic I use to come up with what I want is right because I have the money to enforce it. And so whether they bought a lot of homes or not, the money element can make this sort of ego or this um, entitlement. And it, it's really hard to deal with um, when you're dealing with them in a happy situation or worse in a bad situation. Yeah, I actually have two scenarios I can talk about on that. But we, yeah, we're currently in a, a lawsuit now from out of Galveston. We did a home down there. I won't give any addresses or anything, but we wrote up everything, right? I mean, this, this house is bad. We had siding damage, there was mold, the AC units were rusted through, there was flashing, the roof was leaking. I mean, like you name it, it's in the report. Technician was re requested out, right? So he moves in, he bought the home, he leaves for a few months right? He comes back and then there's even more problems, right? Because they shut down the home and they just left it empty. Came oh back with more problems. And then they started renovating it, did like a $600,000 renovation, right? And, the, and halfway through their renovation, they're like, you know what? Let's sue the home inspector, you know? <laughs> this you know? is sounding, I'm having PTSD over here because this is sounding a little too familiar to a scenario that I can share about. Oh, yeah. But that's why we carry insurance. I'm like, you know what? Fine sue me you know like the, that's the classic too they're doing the big renovation the gut renovation they're like i found this big problem that you missed and i'm like really you're doing a gut renovation man like, come on been siding off the wall but like you could tell you already had mold you just found more mold <laughs> like, yeah so yeah that happened and but so you know how it goes in this guy has the stuff it's called fu money right <laughs> and i'll tell you you know depending on the state that you're in you got to be careful of these people because they're likely people that are involved in other legal matters. So they know the system. Oh, yeah. um, they may have family, friends, or some sort of connections, maybe through a business they're involved in to legal counsel. So their barrier, financial barrier to legal counsel is low or zero. Right. And so not only do they have the money to sue you, but they may not even have the cost to bear to sue. And I, this is my story. I had a $4 million house we did in the rich part of town here. And the guy literally told me, he said, it's not about the money. It's about that. I don't want to pay for this stuff and I'm going to make you do it. And I'm rich enough to sue you. Um, and we just uh, had the insurance settle with him because there was a totally meritless claim, but he was going to press the issue because he knew, and this is a new phrase I learned. He was negotiating against our cost of defense not reality. Right. So as a small time home inspector, and that's all of us listening right. to this, whether you have 10 inspectors or just yourself, we're all small. Your cost of defense is crazy high. If you have to pay for it, or if your insurance has to pay for it, I mean, it's 50, 60, 70, 80, $90,000 to defend yourself in a real court lawsuit. Right. And these people who buy these high end homes, they know this, they've probably been involved in some sort of suit you know, before, you know, probably, I don't know, but he knew this. And so he knew that he could go after the insurance money and he just wasn't, wasn't interested in paying. So he charged back his credit card, got his fee back forcibly. I didn't give it back to him. And then the insurance company had to settle with him. And of course I had to participate in that. So, um, so yeah, man, when they're rich, you got to be extra careful and do what you did, Chris, which is write down everything, right. give them all the information. And even then watch your back. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, it is funny whenever they have that. So what I've actually done is changed up how my fee process that leads into the second scenario is mm. so someone just recently, they called in, they're like, Hey, I've, Chris has done work for me before. And they're buying like a 12,000 square foot home. I oh. literally, I doubled my fees. I was like, that's $3,200. You know, like, I'm just like, I, I don't want to do it, you know, but if you do, if you pay me to do it, because I know I'm going to hear something back from this eventually, I, I made enough money to fix whatever, because you're not going to catch everything on a 12,000 square foot home. It's a lot. It would it, it, be hard. You know, that's going to require three inspectors. You're there all day. And then, you know, building the story of the home, we're all seeing it from different angles. You it's just something's going to happen. So, so I changed it up to where if it's a big home, I'm not going to go and do it for like, you know, 1500 bucks. No, that's, that's double. It's double. Good. 
yeah. Good for you. That, that's super important to know what your limits are. I'll tell you, that has been a hard learning lesson uh, for us. And any inspectors out there who are listening, if you get into the business and you start getting some of these big homes, I remember early on, it's a point of pride. You walk into these big fancy homes, maybe for a famous client or just a rich client, it feels good. You know, you're working on the upper end of the spectrum. You've got nice materials you're looking at. Some of them are really nice to inspect, but I'll tell you, I chased these clients, these agents. I loved these big houses. I, I called it the estate level service. You know I mean? Just, I really thought this was good. And you know what I found over time? It was a schedule buster. It was extra liability that I didn't want. It was extra heartache and conversations with like business managers and other random people involved, you know, in the process. Maybe they're going through a trust or something like that. I found that ultimately I had to learn for our business because we're really more of a, a large business of, for the industry and a volume business that we can make better money with less liability working with average clients with all of our stackable services rather than getting some of these big Berthas, you know? And so I think for a lot of guys, if you like the big ones, make sure that you really, really like it because it has a big effect on your business and it may not be what you think it is. At least it wasn't what I thought it was. So the badge of honor of these big, beautiful, rich people homes I don't even want them anymore. I'm trying to price myself out like you are, man. I want the regular size homes with the regular people because they're much more chill and they don't have money to sue you, basically. Well, and honestly, I, I say this all the time. My, my favorite day, my favorite home inspection day is like a 2,000 and up home, you know, 2,200 square feet, two of them back to back. That's my day. You know, yeah. like I probably, yeah, I might be making 20% less money than you. But guess what? I get my reports are done. I get to go home. I get to open up that cold beer and sit on the couch and, and watch TV. And I didn't wear myself out that day. You know, it's a, two 2,200 square foot homes back to back. That's where the money is. You know, and you know, the report writing is like the secret killer in those big homes because oh, yeah. you might even have a pretty good like inspection process on site, but you better be cr crossing your T's and dotting your I's and you just have more things to write down because the house is so cotton picking big. Yeah. It's like eight bathrooms, you know, eight bathrooms, three laundry rooms, two, three different, four different sightings, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you're not, yeah. So I don't know how we ended up getting in that topic, but yeah. No rich yeah. clients. We were talking about rich clients and how they have these really kind of almost zero tolerance policy. Yeah, so go that the tolerances of the clients. Yeah, that still goes in tolerance of clients. So, but don't go for those big house. I mean, you can't go for the big houses. I would say no. I think that's a niche business, but I I think it's actually almost better suited, quite honestly, for a one man shop who can charge a fair amount of money, take his time or her time, and really, like, really watch yourself. You know, I, I just it doesn't work for our business quite as well. Right. Okay, that kind of leads into the next thing that we wanted to talk about. But before I go into that, the topic that we're going to lead into is uh, how to handle upsell, upset sellers and buyers, because I just got off the phone being yelled at by a seller. So I thought that was a perfect topic to talk about. Yeah. But the, uh, I wanted to talk about our 16-hour business online con uh, topic. Yeah, coming that's right. That's coming up. Yeah. So that's in September. You can sign up through HIW.com. And if you're a Texas home inspector, you get 16 hours of CE credits. We submitted it through ASHI. I don't know, you know how ASHI is. It could take forever to get back for the approval, but this 16 hour business conference, it's all online. It's through zoom and it's pretty much how to structure and run your business at our level. You know, okay. So a lot of these business conferences, they classically talk about marketing, how to market your business, how to go talk to realtors, how to dump candy in a bowl, all that kind of crap. What else are you doing besides the marketing part? So we are going to hit the marketing part. That is a little bit more on my side. So I am going to do, I have a social media class. That's one hour. And then we have a letter, the letter writing campaign that we do. That's another topic, but the biggest thing that we have coming in, it's not just Mary and I are speakers. We have several other speakers there. So we have Paul Zach. He's going to be there and he's going to talk about time is money. So how to manage your time to run your business. We have credit card processing, how to understand credit card processing. Mary's going to talk a difference between sole, sole proprietorships and LLCs. So how mm. to structure your business. 
uh, too as well. And that one's probably super helpful. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we we've changed it up so many times. I, I probably have too many LLCs now, but yeah, we run we run ours through an LLC and then through an S corp. So you know that's but there's several different ways you can set up your business and the tax benefits for it. So she's going to talk about that too as well. Well, that's awesome. My uh, I guess my uh, speaking invitation got lost in the mail. Oh. Um, <laughs> Dang it. I guess I'll have to check with my mailman about that one. Honestly, we probably could fit you in there because oh, you know, come on. I think we can because I have this <laughs> one class it's called the power of doing and I'm not so sure if I'm super happy with it because like it really is just like when I was like super into that motivational talking I, when I talked to you about it before Yeah. and I'm not sure if I 100% want to do it. So if you think of something that you want to talk about for one hour, I bet I can get you in there. Then All right. Well, any listeners are going to have to go sign up and the, the more people that sign up, that'll be an indicator to Chris that you all want me to speak so that, you know, it would all come together. So go sign up right now. It's a one hour time limit. So I know you can talk forever. So you got to make sure that you have that one hour down. You yeah, know. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, this sounds really cool. I'm glad that you guys were able to uh, to shift and still offer this conference for everyone. I honestly, I think the Zoom conferences, while they don't feel as good, uh, I think, to participants or to the speakers, I think they're really important. And I think in this season, all of us in business need stuff like this to continue to learn, to continue to interact with other people because – you know, we're just not getting as many chances to do that. So I'm glad you're doing it. Good job. I hope that all y'all listening will go uh, sign up. I'm probably going to try to attend a couple classes. I heard, Chris, you tell me earlier that you've even got a couple technical classes peppered in uh, to get it all mixed up. Right. Yeah. So this is completely separate outside of the 16 hours. So oh. they're just one hour. Uh, we hold these typically on a Friday morning. Yeah. Like Friday morning. And they're specific topics. They're like hot topics. And it's just the basics. So it's the basics of plumbing, stucco, electrical, aluminum wiring. And a lot of people, they want like this super, super technical stuff, but they forget the basics are what keeps us in mm. business. You know, like yeah. being able to identify those basic problems or understanding how stucco is installed. By you. And it's just a one hour quick out class. And if you are a Texas home inspector, you get one hour credit. And that's just another thing that we're waiting on Ashy to see if they'll approve the credit hours. <clears throat> There's some sort of sports hours. analogy here about like uh, doing the basics to be good at your sport. I don't know. I'm not much on the sports thing. So <laughs> yeah. just fill in your own sports yeah. analogy in your mind, people. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So the one hour class and you can go to HIW.com or sorry, I'm, that's actually wrong. It's HomeIW.com. Home IW. Yeah. yeah so it's HomeIW.com, uh, HomeInspectionWhisperer.com. And now, Chris, have you, uh, would you be able to give um, any sort of assistance to any inspectors listening now? If they wanted to submit your class to their state for credit, would you be able to maybe, you or Mary, be able to help them with that a little bit? Uh, I could probably figure out something. So, like, are, are, you, do you, are you licensed to teach in your state? Is that what you're saying? And then So, some states don't have any requirement for that. Some states have a process. I know in Tennessee, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and if anyone who's listening is in Tennessee, um, come to me directly and I can help you navigate this process because I have a number of classes that I've gotten approved for CE education. And so we can just take uh, home inspection whisperer material, get a push to the state and get you credit and CE credit. Yeah, that'd be great because I have a few, few people reached out from like Louisiana and stuff and they're like, oh man, can you teach a class in Louisiana? And I'm like, man, I've barely got the Texas stuff set up, <laughs> you know, but I mean, that sounds nice, but you know, we're still, the school's still pretty beginner, you know, so and I think that actually doing this online conference is really perfect because it will lead into that in-person thing. That we had, yeah. I'm pretty upset about the whole in-person thing, man. We had, we had like 12 people signed up, you know, and home, home inspectors were notorious for like last minute. So totally. we had a bunch of people call in. They're like, hey, is this still going on? I'm like, no, because people are dying. You know how that goes. You know how that goes. <laughs> um, although if you are interested in this credit, figure out at your state level – and then come to Chris um, and talk about it because a lot of the times in the 38 states that have licensure, it's actually not nearly as hard as you think it might be, except for like Illinois and a couple outliers that just make it stupid hard. Most of the states are pretty easy. And so that might be a benefit for everyone listening. So you think that 
we actually probably can just let, create a certificate and they just show that they went through like this online class. Or yeah, I think every state will be a little custom, but it's definitely something that if you guys have done Texas, which I know Trek can be kind of intense, yeah. you can do almost every other state. Tennessee, for example, super easy. Oh yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that being it, that slight commercial there, uh, we wanted to <laughs> Welcome talk back everyone. Yeah. <laughs> We wanted to talk about how to handle like upset sellers and buyers. And so that kind of leads into the scenario now where one, my home inspector, he wrote up, you know, this 12 year old AC and he just wrote, you know, technician needed, you know, the coils need to be cleaned or whatever. It was small stuff, you know, poor airflow at a duct, you know, whatever. And man, this, this seller was like, he's like some engineer you know how the engineers are oh yeah and he was like he was like no he said he took the reading at the coil but he went to the furthest pot in my entire home and took a measure from the duck and took a measure from the floor and like you know just this whole speech i'm like sir 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 you know i can't even talk to you because you're yelling at me so much you know like that's just pretty much what i said to him i was like you got to calm down he was like okay i'm like what do you want <laughs> You know, that I figured yeah. out that actually works. You, instead of them just yelling at you the entire time, if you just sit there and you say, what do you want? And then he goes, well, I want you to come back here right now and show that my AC is working. And I'm going to stand here and let you do it. I'm like, okay, did your deal fall through? And he was like, no, they're purchasing my house anyways. And I'm like, okay, so why do you want me to come back? He's like, he was like, because you're creating false reports and I have to sell a house that's $5,000 less. I'm like, well, that's not the only thing that was wrong on your home. You know, your roof was leaking and, you know, all this other stuff. And, and he was like, glad your airflow is good, but you got a roof leak. <laughs> yeah. But and he was like, no, you, he's like, how do you live with yourself? And I was like yelling at me and I'm like, okay. And you got to calm down. Like, I, I was like, do you understand how the home inspection process works? He's like, he's like, He's like, yes, I do. I'm like, okay, well, let me explain it to you <laughs> because obviously he doesn't. Well, yeah. and you know, some of these people, I find that if I can just sort of put on my thick skin, they just want to be heard. They just want to like get out there, you know, they're moaning and they're groaning about this and that. And I, I like to give them some space to moan and groan because they may not feel like they have anyone to talk to. So I kind of just think, you know, being a punching bag for a few seconds is okay. Now, if, they, if they're yelling and they're being absurd, obviously you need to sort of bring it down to a diplomatic place. But, you know, for the most part, leading them to what you said, super important. What do you want? I don't lead with that typically. I typically try to tuck that in at the end after I've listened and asked questions and try to do exploratory. But yeah, asking them what they want, getting them to come to a head because a lot of them just have this sort of wild frustration or wild anger and they haven't focused it. Some have, but if you can get them to say what they want, sometimes it's actually an embarrassing thing and for them to have to say it out loud makes them calm themselves down. Like, I want you to give me my money back. Sir, you're the seller. You haven't paid any money, you know, or, um, you know, I want you to change this report, sir. I don't think that's going to matter to your situation. You know, no blood, no foul, whatever. So I, I think asking them what they want is a great way to sort of clarify the conversation. Yeah. So you're, what you think I probably did wrong is instead of just, I should just let them yell at me a little longer, you know, explain the whole situation of how he's correct and then ask him what he wanted. Well, I, I saw a meme recently that was said, um, nobody in the history of calming down has ever calmed down by someone saying calm down. And so I find, <laughs> uh, I find that to be true with my wife when I say, hey, calm down. She just doesn't calm down. And so, um, <laughs> so I find that, you know, I have to use, it's, it's kind of like a chess game. It's like a chess game. I have to outplay them not just like slam them, you know? And so uh, I don't think you did wrong. I just try to find the artful way to let them come to the point that they're being absurd. Or I just try to keep them, just hitting them with little facts, just little baby facts that keep yeah. their feet ground on the ground because they want to float up in the air in emotional, emotional atmosphere. And I want to say, no, let's stay down here on the ground with facts. Sir, we're home inspectors. We don't check the airflow. We just put our hand over it. It kind of felt weak. I'm not sure it's that big of a deal. It may indicate a problem. Maybe you should have a technician come out. That's what we said in our report. Yeah. Everybody should just chill. Yeah, you kept saying, well, you said it wasn't working. I'm like, well, actually, that's not what it says. It just says it wasn't performing as intended. You know, that, that's two different things. And like, reading well, out of your own report, reading out of your own report can be really helpful. Just yeah. saying what's in the report 
can be really helpful because a lot of times it's this terrible game of telephone, especially if you're talking to a seller. You know, they didn't read the report because they don't, the listing agent doesn't want the report. And right. so the buyer is told the buyer's agent who's told the listing agent who's told the seller. And so it's all mangled by the time that you're talking to them. And so you say, sir, this is what it says. And you read it, you know, and this is what this means. This is what we meant when we wrote it, blah, blah, blah. Right. So, I mean, just keeping their feet on the ground, super important. Yeah, I don't think there was any keeping this guy's feet on the ground. <laughs> After I explained it, I was like, all right, so all you have to do is just have someone service it. Did you do that? He's like, no, I'm in Louisiana or whatever, Illinois. You know, he was just, you know, like yelling at me or something. And I was like, um, he's like, and they asked for this much money off. And I'm like, so are they still buying your home? And he goes, yes. It's like, all right, if the home doesn't get purchased for whatever reason, I'll come out there myself and look at the HVAC again, and I'll fix whatever needs to be fixed, if it even needs to. Are they, and he's like, he was like, how do you live with yourself? Do you go to church? You know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, all right, sir, I'm getting off the phone now. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you know, I don't yeah. know how to, you know, know how to handle this. People don't live in our professional world, and you got to have thick skin if you're in this business. Oh, yeah. But I will say, after doing this for eight years, there are times where my skin is too thick where I'm too callous to their reality because I live with it every day. So what's a normal thing for me, just normal stuff about dryer vents and whatever else, this is like big news for them. They don't know what this stuff is. They've not talked about dryer vents or airflow with anyone. So they get all out of whack. And in some ways I kind of am like, okay, I, I get it a little bit. And so I just try to hit them with little facts and just try to share. I say phrases like, well, in our experience, you know, this is what we see for a lot of people, you know, or something like that, just to remind them, hey, in context, like, this is a small problem, it might feel like a big problem. And that's okay, I support your emotions. But you know, this is a small problem in like the land of facts, you know, and so like, just trying to keep their feet on the ground. It's super hard, because they're just like, ah, you know, I, sh I should have just been like, hey, you want to talk to my friend Conrad, you know, like, <laughs> we'll talk to no. you all day. No, I, I, I'm, I might be good at conflict resolution, but I want out of it. I'm trying to find someone who will do it for me for my company. Yeah, that, that's, that's tough, man. They always want to talk to the owner. Oh, I know. Yeah. But yeah, sellers can be particularly hard because they don't always have the information. You're, you're sort of insulting their baby. Sellers who've been in their houses for a long time. Yeah, this, Oof, this that's a tough one. Minute. Yeah, he's been there for a minute, you could tell. And so, yeah, it's, they, they're like, I lived here for 20 years, you know. I haven't had any problems with it. Okay. <laughs> you know, you're Bruce Lee, and, by the way. And there's posturing. There, there's a, um, there's a, a sort of a kabuki dance posturing, you know, that goes on with, especially with listing agents, I would say, because there's a professional posturing. They're putting on a show that's not really just for you. It's also for like the buyer's agent so that they don't appear to show weakness, you know, or some stupid, some idea, but they'll posture and they'll trumped up, you know, flagrant, you know, sort of language. In reality, it's not that big of a deal. And they may even know that, but it's like uh, soccer. You know how sometimes a soccer player will fall down when it's they're like faking an injury to like to try to elicit a red card or yellow card? It's like that. It's like, come on, nobody even touched you. Yeah, negotiations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're posturing for negotiations. Totally. Yeah. And that, that leads into this one time I had a conversation with the listing agent. It was pretty <laughs> funny. I don't know if galvanized plumbing is bad in your area. but Yeah, a little bit. In Houston, it's like really bad. Our water is like ripped it up and it's just going bad all over the place. And she's like, so you're saying all the galvanized pipes are bad. And I'm like, well, you do have some problems on yours, but it's not all bad in your house. But it is, I, we inform our clients to let them know that they are going across Houston. She's like, so you're explaining to me that across all of Houston, all the galvanized water lines are going bad. I'm like, Yeah. You know, she's like, do you realize how big that would be? I'm like, yeah, I know it's pretty bad. You know, <laughs> and she was just trying to, she was trying to dumb down the fact that they had galvanized water lines and the clients, the buyers were, were like, well, I don't know if I want a galvanized water line home anymore. I'm like, I right, let them know that all the homes are going to have galvanized water lines in that area, but it's just something they would need to be informed about. It's going to cost you $5,000 just to repipe your home. But she, it was just like you were saying, like, they try to play to the scenario be like yes it is bad <laughs> you know and they're gonna fall back on their experience the agents are and their experience depending on the situation depending on who it is can be actually limited it, it might actually be 
way different than what you would think. You know, maybe you get a 10, 20 year experienced agent, but they've only sold a couple homes in this neighborhood. They've only sold a couple homes in the city. They've only sold a couple homes in Galvanized Point, whatever it is. Like yeah. their experience actually might be limited. And so you as an inspector, you see galvanized plumbing all the friggin' time. You're like, you can't, you got to remember that they might be relatively new for them. And the temptation is always for me to be like, I'm sorry, I'm probably a subject matter expert on this. Why don't you just go ahead and listen to me? But I can't say that, you know, because that just belittles them, you know? So you have to sort of like couch it and phrase it and, you know, cushion the blow a little bit, but you have to communicate. These are the facts. They don't change just because you don't like them, you know? And yeah. You know, I, but that came into what you were talking about before we even started the podcast of being like, why can't we be that home inspector? Be like, listen, I know what I'm talking about is what I do for a living. And you sell homes for a living. My job is to know everything wrong with the home. So I'm probably right and you're wrong. You know, just, just flat out say Go ahead it. and piss off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you know. Just Google it. Just Google it. Somewhere along right. down the line, 40 years ago, our poor profession we, we started at the wrong spot in the starting line. You know, like I, we have somehow found ourselves subjugated to all of these people that know less about these things. And they think they know more merely because of position. And it's, it's both hilarious and terribly sad all at the same time that a lot of the home inspectors listening here, certainly you and I and the guys we work, you know, interact with, like we are subject matter experts on at least a couple dozen things. And yet no one gives us our due. They're like, I'm going to call some random contractor who just got his license, you know, and have him tell me what I want to hear. And it's like, come on, you know, seriously, like, please, I'm trying to do this for everyone's help and benefit. Yeah. Uh, I understand airflow in a crawl space, you know, <laughs> like this, this guy out here saying that I don't know. I'm like, your home's been built for 110 years and there's no mold or rot underneath there. Of course, it's not going to be to current day standards, but it made it 110 years. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, uh, and my encouragement to, to the guys out there listening, guys and gals listening is, if you're not a subject matter expert on something, that's okay. But know your limitations and know your strengths. Play to your strengths and be cautious in your limitations. And don't paint yourself into a corner because there are some agents that do know a lot. Many of them are out of their depth and you can be a great help to them. But don't paint yourself into a corner. It just hurts you and the profession, you know? And so just know what you know and try to fill in the blanks. You don't go to conferences like Chris's and, and try to fix the areas where you're deficient because you can be the subject matter expert and you just got to work at it. Have you heard anything about the ASHI conference? You know, you know, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about that right now. There's some uh, <clears throat> surveys going around about, would you attend a digital? Would you attend an in-person? They're asking the speakers, would you prefer this? Would you prefer that? I know that usually um, in any industry, big national conferences get contractually decided upon years in advance. So mm -hmm. I don't know about ASHI, but they may actually have some obligations contractually that they need to figure out uh, with, I think, Vegas they're going to this year in January. Um, I know go? that, would I go? Yeah. You know, I, I'd like to say yes right now. We've been pretty cautious, um, but I'd like to say yes. I'm, I'm hoping to speak and um, always a good time to get away and, you know, see some of the folks in the business. So I, I'm giving a fingers crossed yes. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go. Mary might not go, but like, I think I'm going to go. And I am, I did submit a social media class to hmm. each show. Which one did, did you do your mold class? I've got a crawl spaces class, uh, a mold class, and a multi inspect building a multi inspector business oh, class. Are they playing on that uh, this They're, year? They I might. know they were leading into it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they've, they've got a whole multi-inspector track that they're supposed right. to be doing. So this plays into that. We'll see if it all makes. And that one, the one sit-in that we did, I know you didn't stay the whole time, but where Ruben was up there and yeah. uh, they were all talking about, and I was like, man, that was really cool. You know, I took a bunch of notes and it kind of showed me that I was somewhat doing it right. <laughs> you know, I know, you know what's funny is that I think a lot of guys out there, a lot of guys and gals are thinking to themselves, I want to go multi-inspector. And so they're hungry for the information, but I have a theory. My theory is that a lot of them will end up finding out that they actually don't want to grow their business. But along the way, they're going to pick up business mindsets and business skills and business ideas because on the whole, 
most of your multi-inspector companies by accident or by intention have had to learn business mindset to grow your business. And that's actually good for everyone, whether you're a one man, one woman shop or whether you're a big business. And so I think you could almost in the future call a multi-inspector track just a business track because a lot of the information is heavily overlapped. And so I'm glad they're doing it because it ends up pointing a lot of people's minds towards business acumen rather than just technical acumen, you know, around like technical skills and knowledge. So you're saying that it should be just considered business track, not multi-inspector track. I mean, ideally sort of philosophically, but I think that we have watered down the idea of what a business track means. And so we sort of have to go away from that at least for a little bit. You know, I tell this to people all the time. They're like, hey, I'm thinking about hiring my first inspector or, you know, they reach out to me and I'm all, and I always tell them like, hey man, this is something you really want to think about because I wasted a lot of time and money to get to the point. And now I think I just now started making more money than I would if I was just by myself. You know, like if I was just by myself, I know some people that are really successful or they answer their own phones. You know, I would never answer my own phones, but they, uh, but they, they do everything and they're at like a, you know, an 80% profit margin or something oh really God. hot, you know, just running their own business. They're answering their phones, they have their own schedule, you know, they just, and they document and they send everything out and they have a little bit of automation and yeah, it's nice and simple and it works, Right. And then someone like me, I automate everything, like absolutely everything. And so you have to really think like it's either your time or your money. And then do you really want this responsibility? And what happens if they miss stuff? You know, you have to really play and you have to think about these things. And most of the time they start thinking, they're like, I'm like, yeah, man, just raise your rates. <laughs> just, just yeah. Raise your rates. <clears throat> yeah. There's uh, there's definitely a consideration. You got to be the right personality though, to run a well-oiled, successful, small operation. Cause you got to wear a lot of hats. You got to be pretty organized and quite honestly, you got to have a lot of margin and time and space in your life in which to do all the various things. I found personally that uh, as a guy, relatively young guy with a young family, I needed to leverage into being bigger so that I could recapture some of like the important things in my personal life because I didn't have the margin, you know, I was working so long because I just didn't have the time. And so, um, yeah, it's a little different for everyone. You know, this kind of brings a good idea. You were talking a while ago about wanting to do some sort of like multi-part series with your home inspection whisperer podcast about like how to start a multi or uh, how to start a multi-inspector business or how just how to start a home inspection business, but take a different take on it where you are looking at some of the, the things that get overlooked that are important for starting a business. Right. Maybe we could start a series where we sort of look at some of those finer points of how to start a home inspection business. Yeah. So that, that does lead into the next commercial just real quick. Uh, mm. Mary wrote a book on, and it's on our home IW.com page about how we run our home inspection business. And it literally is a step-by-step -step process. And, we could literally just go off with page one and break down all the topics, like what you think about that and what I think about that. And we could just be like episode one. And I think, love that. yeah, and I think that would be perfect. We lead well, it in how to, how to, how to get into the home inspection business. Man, maybe I should write a book where I read your book and then like draw red lines through the parts that I think are terrible and then like tell what I think should be done. That would be my book. What do yeah, you think? Just, just pay me some royalties. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll split it with you. <laughs> Yes. Well, good. Well, um, I, I love to be able to talk about some of the things that get overlooked, you know, and some of the training or the classes that you see online, because I see so many inspectors get in and they're hungry for information and it's just missing out there. So I think the Home Inspection Whisperer podcast is really meeting a need. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Obviously, I have a, a following of my own at The Diligent Inspector. You can find me on Facebook and on YouTube. And I'm actually going to uh, repost this whole um, interview and podcast on my pages as well. So we can get it out there. Nice. Uh, with the, how is your YouTube channel doing? It is dead because COVID had me down. I got oh. the COVID blues, my friend, but right. you know what? I'm rising like the Phoenix come, coming out of it. I'm ready to have the internet see me again. <laughs> Man, I tell you that the COVID blues hit me pretty hard too. I'm not going to lie. It got, it got me. I, yeah, and I, I was fine. I'm like, nothing's going to knock me down. And then when they took my gym away, then I was like, all right, well, you lost my motivation there. And then I was like, well, I'll start walking. Started doing all the walking and then again, Texas, you can't walk out in 110 degrees heat and 1 yeah. million percent humidity. So, 
And then I was like, then I got stuck inside and man, I'm an antsy person. And then, yeah, I just was like, you can't be making content when you're in a terrible mood. You just can't do it. Yeah, it's bad. Well, I look forward to seeing more content from both of us. All right. So good. Well, I think we should end this episode right here. And then we do have Conrad coming up again. So uh, make sure that you give him a follow on his, on his YouTube page, his Facebook. And in, you have your Instagram too, don't you? Yep, we have an yeah. Insta. Yeah, so look him up, Diligent Home Inspections, the Diligent Inspector. What, what is it? So make sure you make sure they find you exactly. Yeah, you can, uh, you can Google for Diligent or Diligent Environmental, which is my environmental testing company, or the Diligent Inspector on Facebook. Um, and you'll find my ugly mug if you just look a little bit. So <laughs> Nice. All right, so we'll end it there, and uh, we'll kick off the next episode later date so that's uh, the home inspection whisper podcast and thank you for listening and catch us next week see ya